So welcome to our online version of today's class. And my apologies, um, I, you know, got some kind of a bug or something, which I'm sure you can probably hear in my voice. Uh, it would have been much easier for me to be uh, in uh, in the class with you all today uh, than to do this. But um, but we're here, and one of the nice things about about um, um, the new tech world we find ourselves in because of COVID is that I can now do this remotely and we won't have to miss any time uh, in class. So you'll, you'll already have noticed that in this class, we have been, we have been um, giving you the videos for the class before time, beforehand, and then we come to class and there's a certain redundancy to what we do in class. And the idea behind this is that um, that you know you 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 hit the same material in different ways, and you learn something new from it uh, by by seeing it presented even by me in different ways with the interaction with you all. So in that spirit, I'm going to today uh, walk you through uh, walk you through what we would have looked at in class today with you know maybe just a little bit different take, a little bit different narrative uh, than you have uh, in those videos. And of course, as always, you know I have office hours. And, and you can certainly talk to me um, um, after class as well about about any of the issues you have uh, with understanding this particular um, um, part of the law. All right, so we look at hearsay, and we're now looking at statements that are not hearsay in 809. This is, um, if you look at this particular rule, and you're saying this looks like exceptions to hearsay because we're going to get to things in rules 803 and 804 that are actually called exceptions to hearsay. And when you look at those, um, there will there is a, a sense in which um, the, um, the, the these are essentially exceptions to hearsay. Well, in fact, that's that's really kind of what these things are. They say they are not hearsay. They're defined as not being hearsay. But you only move to 801D if, in fact, you haven't shown if you if you've shown that it otherwise meets the requirements of hearsay hearsay in 801D uh, 1A through C. So we come to these these statements that we're going to look at today that are regarded as not hearsay. And like I say, conceptually, you want to think of these as just exceptions. You know that's fine by me. There will be some federal judges, some state judges that you won't appear in front of. More often, the federal judges have, have served as editors of the law review, and they're more kind of picky about precision in the, in the nomenclature of the rules. Um, there will be some federal judges uh, who, will, in, in particular, who will want you to call this non-hearsay. It operates like exceptions to hearsay. Conceptually, there's no real difference uh, at all. But 801D um, goes through a few of these, and we're going to look at the first uh, um, uh, the first part of them today. We're going to look at uh, D uh, D1, uh, and um, actually the, all the D1 parts today. Um, those statements which were made prior to the court proceeding that are currently inconsistent with what the declarant is saying now on the stand, uh, that which is consistent. And that's a much more complicated concept to get your head around. And then the third one is uh, 801 uh, D1C, and that's a prior identification. Now that is um, that's basically a lineup. And if you if you look at D1C and think lineup, then that's that's what we're really talking about there. But uh, let's start off with prior inconsistent statements because that's where we're going to begin our talk today. And and what we see there is that in the um, in this rule, if a person makes a statement prior to trial, prior to trial um, or prior to, the, to, the, to his or her testimony, and it was made under penalty of perjury at a hearing uh, trial or other proceeding. So a different trial, some kind of hearing or other proceeding or deposition. And the word proceeding there is going to become the really the really tricky one to unpack. That's the one that requires uh, the most interpretation or in a deposition. Now, deposition involves cross-examination. A trial involves that. Hearings almost always involve the possibility of cross-examination, but other proceeding does not necessarily. That you know, we don't know what other proceeding is. That's that's the word that that really in that in that D1A rule is the most vague. It doesn't really have a fully defined category. 
So we're going to look at, you know, look at a couple cases to kind of flesh this, this rule out for you. And the first one is a really, really easy case. So we look at um, the prior inconsistent statements. We look at the Truman case. And in the Truman case, Truman had testified in a previous state trial uh, about things that his father had done in this, this arson. Uh, the, the business hadn't gone well. They decided to, to burn that to burn the um, the business down to get the, the, the insurance money. And the father testifies against the son in in the first arson trial. Um, the um, um, the problem we have though is when we get to the federal trial, the son is no longer willing uh, to testify against the father. And so the question is whether the the statements that he made at the first trial come in. Now, the only reason this is a tricky case at all, uh, you know, you have a prior trial. Trial is one of the one of the categories that's absolutely permitted for the prior inconsistent statement. You've got a prior trial, um, and um, and it's you know under oath, the whole thing actually even subject to cross examination, which is not a requirement. Those um, the only thing that makes this tricky is that the son doesn't actually deny that the father was involved in the arson. He simply says that he's not going to testify. So the Truman case is useful for us in, in describing that, that um, a refusal to testify, or we'll learn later, a failed memory, uh, is, is uh, something that will, um, will be regarded as inconsistent with a previous testimony to something. So you know, how do we regard testimony? We could say, like, you know, Involved in arson, not involved in the arson. If, if he said in the first trial he was involved in the arson, the second trial he was not involved in the arson, well, then that's, then that's, um, um, you know, that's clearly inconsistent. But in some ways, what we can say in terms of looking at consistent or inconsistency in this rule is that something is inconsistent with nothing. So if you refuse to testify or can't remember, then your previous testimony where you said something that something is inconsistent with nothing or the refusal or the failed memory. That wouldn't necessarily have to be the case, um, but, but it is. And, um, and so, you know, we have, uh, we have that interpretation in, in Truman. In the Dennis case, again, I think we have a, a failed memory case, uh, but we've already kind of discussed that issue in, um, um, in, the, uh, in the Truman case, something is inconsistent with nothing, so even a failed memory uh, can can provide the, the right for the, the proponent of the evidence to go back and get the prior under oath testimony of, of the declarant. But now in the Dennis case, our issue is this. We're talking about a grand jury. And I'm certain that in the video on Dennis that I talked about, we looked at grand jury. Uh, we talked about grand juries and what they are. They, they meet in secret. Only the prosecution is present. The defense is not present. There is no cross examination, and so in that case, um, you know, we talk about what is this other proceeding, uh, trial, the, uh, trial hearing, other proceeding, or deposition? What is this other proceeding? How how what are the requirements for it? Well, in the Dennis case, we learned that <clears throat> that a grand jury proceeding, which is, which is what they're actually called, is sufficient to qualify as as uh, a, a proceeding under 801 uh, D1A, and is therefore uh, going to be admissible if, if the person's testimony at trial is inconsistent with that. Here, a failed memory is inconsistent with what, with what uh, the, the declarant said in the, in the um, grand jury. And so that's now going to, um, that's now going to come in. Um, so it, there's not a requirement of, of cross-examination. There is a requirement of a proceeding, and you know the grand jury it it you know meets in a courthouse. The judge swears in the witness, or the judge swears in the witnesses. Um, there's no judge in the room during the grand jury, but there's a flag there in a courthouse. The prosecutor is you know impaneled or has, has impaneled the grand jury, all of whom have been sworn in by judges, uh, by a judge. So that's that's the basic contour of of you know we have to have something that looks like a proceeding. It might also remind you of something from corporate law. Uh, the, the corporate minutes establish, you know, the corporation. The minutes can be on notebook paper, but they have to be regularly kept. What are the things that establish, you know, the corporate minutes? 
it's the regularity. It's the things that make them look like you're actually holding these these meetings. Um, <clears throat> the the um, the prior inconsistent statement that has to be made at a trial or deposition or hearing or other proceeding that other proceeding has to look like a proceeding, and we're kind of fleshing out what that what that looks like. So in in state versus SUA, um, we're now pushing that boundary even further. Uh, you have you have a statement made to a law enforcement officer. Now, in both <clears throat> Dennis and Sua, you find a very common a very common um, occurrence for um, for these um, 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 for these types of of, of occurrences. Um, we all, sorry that was garbled. Um, we often are looking at prior inconsistent statements because witnesses forget or deny they said something or or refuse to testify. And usually that's because they're under some kind of threat or often it is anyhow. In Dennis, that case, if you look at it, involved extortionist uh, credit rates. That kind of had a mob case feel to it. The SUA case uh, involves domestic violence. And <clears throat> the rule on prior inconsistent statements if it wasn't not designed to capture um, victims' initial statements to um, to um, judges when they when they swear out warrants, it at least has been has been used to achieve this goal. Because I mean, as as with mob prosecutions, significant pressure is often put on domestic violence victims to recant their stories, and we want to be able to capture um, or we want to be able to capture those statements. That are you know probably true, um, but but um, and, and you know there's a public interest in making sure people don't go back into abusive situations. So the Sua case looks at how far that goes. So you know when when the the, the there's a case cited in Sua where the, the the complaining witness goes to you know a, a police clerk and swears something under oath uh, in the police department that that would have been sufficient here. It's simply a statement made to the police officer, not made under penalty of perjury. So one of the things that that we learn is whatever proceeding means, and, it can, and this, as we can see in some of the cases that are cited in the Sua case, um, it can involve it can involve um, you know some some things that aren't you know terribly proceeding like uh, it can involve you know a, a statement to the to a um, um, Magister, uh, magisterial district justice. It can involve a statement made to um, to a police clerk if it's if it's you know in the police station. At least if it's in the police station and made under oath. If 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 the complaining witness had made the statement to the police officer and signed it under oath under penalty of perjury, this may even have been enough. But we do know that the court says in State versus Sewell, whatever, however much we're willing to, to stretch this definition to capture the concern about recanting witnesses in domestic violence prosecutions, whatever that the legitimacy of that is, uh, the um, the rule actually requires the state to be under penalty of perjury. So if we don't qualify for that, it doesn't qualify. So let me that kind of encapsulates our prior inconsistent statement rule. But let me go back to the rule for just a second, because I want to make something really, really clear about this. Um, when we look at the rule, um, 801 D1A is inconsistent with the declarant's testimony was given under penalty of perjury at a trial hearing or other proceeding or in a deposition. We're going to get to a rule in the 600 series that allows prior inconsistent statements that are not under oath to come in as impeachment. So, you know, if you say something in the grand jury, that's under oath and that can come in under this rule. If you're talking to your bartender or your barber before trial and it's inconsistent with what you testify to, your barber can come in and talk about the fact that, that, that you've made an inconsistent statement, but it won't come in under this rule. Why do we care? We're going to learn in the, in later about the distinction between substantive and impeachment evidence. The and, and I'll talk about this in our recap of this class on Wednesday. Uh, but but you can you can bring the evidence in as substantive or impeachment. In this case, it's substantive. The prosecution can actually use the fact that the, the witness at the grand jury made these statements that are inconsistent with the denial here in court, can actually use the statements made to 
the police clerk under oath about about the domestic violence that that she denies when she goes when she goes to court. The prosecution can use those to base a prosecution on, or the plaintiff can use that to base the base liability on. If you're the defendant, you don't care. You don't have to prove a case. You just have to you have to convince the jury that the elements weren't sufficiently met to either preponderance or beyond a reasonable doubt, depending on whether it's a civil or criminal case. But um, but with Rule 801 D1A, it has to be under oath if it's going to be part of the substantive proof. If you're the plaintiff or the prosecutor, you care about this. If you're the defense, you don't. Um, and so if you have no other proof on any of these elements that you're bringing in by prior inconsistent statements, they'll have to come in under 801 D1A or else you will have failed to satisfy an important element of the or an essential element of the case. And, and you won't you want a, a conviction or, a, or a, a finding of liability will not be sustained by a jury if you only have a prior inconsistent statement that's not under oath. But let's say a witness gets on the stand and offer something inconsistent with what he or she told her bartender. Um, the bartender can come in and testify to undermine that witness's story, and the jury can then not believe that witness. Um, but the bartender's story doesn't become substantive evidence upon which a plaintiff or a prosecutor can build the case. This is a really, really important concept, so I will, I will go over that in depth again as we begin class uh, on, on Wednesday. So then we look at prior consistent statements. Prior consistent statements are, um, are a little more complicated um, because, because it's not at all clear why you should be allowed to use these. We know that you know, people shouldn't just be allowed to then come in and have you know, 100 of their friends come and testify um, that, that they told the same story to them um, prior to trial to kind of bolster the witness's, the witness's um, claim. But what we do with this rule is we say that um, that um, the um, the fact that the witness has been attacked, let's say the witness's memory has been attacked, and the witness you know can't can't remember as well uh, uh, now as uh, he, that like the witness's story doesn't include certain facts that it previously included, or it includes some inconsistencies um, because people's memories fail. Well, what if prior to the trial, you told 20 people the same details, and now you're fuzzy on one of the details? Your, your failed memory could be bolstered by the fact that you told other people the details that now your opponents or the opponents of your, of your statement are trying to say, you know, look, this might not be real because, because these details aren't the same as, as the previous details. You can bring in those prior inconsistent statements to rebut um, to rebut a claim that that someone has tried to make to show why this statement is is you know not not the truth. State versus Duncan, uh, kind of an older case, uh, even though it's two thousand three. This was before the amendment to this rule, and so under this 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 case looks at how you go up showing that that a a cross examination amounted to an attack on veracity. Prior inconsistent statements, a person could be confused. Uh, a person could fail to remember. And at the time Duncan was decided, you had to show that that the attack was meant to undermine the person's credibility as a truth teller, not just that they made a mistake in this particular telling in order to bring in a prior consistent statement. And so the court here has to answer the question of at what point does the questions about prior inconsistencies amount to a claim this person is not a truth teller as opposed to simply mistaken? And they said the court looks at this in a case by case basis, how many inconsistencies are pointed out, what's the tone of the questioning, et cetera, et cetera. When we get to the Finch case, you'll see this, the Duncan case is a little less substantial because there are a lot of ways you can now bring prior consistent statements in. So let's go to the Tome case. The Tome case prior to, prior to these 2014 amendments, the Tome case was you know, the best case to describe the law on prior consistent statements. And to kind of put this in a nutshell, if, if, you're, if the people who are cross-examining you are claiming that you have a bias, there's a reason that you want, um, you, there, there, there's a, that your testimony is shaded by, by a certain bias you might have. 
then the only reason that a prior inconsistent statement would be relevant or would be sufficiently relevant uh, would be to show that it was made before the bias. So let's say you're trying to impress a potential employer um, and you didn't even know of this employer's existence prior to your in-court testimony. And uh, and your your previous testimony was consistent with what, what it is now when you now have this bias. You're trying to impress someone you're trying to be employed by. You can imagine this with an expert witness. We talked about State Farm as you know, just one of the big insurers. Uh, they, they retain a lot of expert witnesses. You can imagine an expert witness wanting to impress uh, State Farm so that they would get more, more work. But let's say before you even knew you might be hired by them, this was your this was your testimony. That would be a pre-bias, a pre-bias um, statement. Uh, and if, if the the person cross-examining the witness is claiming that the that the witness has a bias, then only those those statements that came in before or that occurred before the, the bias was developed would actually be sufficiently relevant, uh, according to the court and tome, um, to come in to show um, uh, to show a prior consistent statement. All right, then. We get the 2004 amendments to Finch, uh, or, or to, to the to, to this rule, to 801 D1 um, D1B, um, and in this case, uh, we have an application of that. And this rule says that that you can bring in you can bring in um, prior consistent statements to rebut uh, any type of of attack that's been made on on the witness. So if it's failed memory, if you're saying Look, you don't remember this story, do you? Uh, you had all these other facts in there. You don't remember it. This is inconsistent with what you told there. Maybe you don't remember the story at all. Maybe your, your testimony today is just flawed. And if that's the claim, uh, and you're bringing the prior consistent statement in to bolster a claim that the witness's memory has failed uh, and that the witness is telling um, that the witness never knew the story because they don't know it today, um, and the story, therefore, you know, is not, not correct, um, then you can bring the prior consistent statements in uh, to rebut a a, a, an allegation that there's failed memory, uh, and that failed memory, therefore, means that the underlying account was not true. So, you know, let's say that the, um, the witness uh, testifies that uh, the car that ran the red light was blue, um, and, and it was actually red. Um, that like, you know, we're, there's only one car we're talking about here and the witness says it was blue, but it was actually red. If this witness had previously said that the car was red uh, and that, 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 um, that that's not like a failure to comprehend or remember, that's just, that's just a you know, loss of detail. You could show that by saying, look, previously when this person told the story, it was always red. Uh, that this is that, you know, this don't discount the story because the witness can't now remember detail. When the witness first told the story, there were, it, was, it had all the details that we now know to be correct in, this, in the tale. Uh, this is just failed memory at this point. On the small, on the small issue, uh, it rehabilitates the witness on, on that point. Uh, so, uh, and we see this in, in the Finch case, you know, with, with child witnesses who you know, can't remember certain details, uh, the prior consistent statement can, can come in. All right, so prior identification. Uh, this is um, this is a line item, and um, in 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 um, in the uh, uh, Kaka, oh, I don't know the K case. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, uh, in the K case, um, the uh, the question is, what exactly is a a prior identification? In this case, someone walked up to the officer and said, "You know, John shot. I know John. John was the guy. I saw him shoot the victim." Is that a prior identification? And no, it's not. And we'll go back and look at the rule on this. Um, identify someone at, uh, the defendant perceived earlier. Um, so what does that actually mean? What is this, you know, what is this um, uh, 801 D1C identifies a, a person as someone the declarant perceived earlier? The classic example is a lineup. Now, if, if, um, the a witness to the crimes walking along and and with a police officer and or anybody and the assailant is walking down the street and the witness goes that's him that would in fact satisfy this rule identifies the person as someone the declarant perceived earlier 
This does not mean, though, I mean, I understand how the, a person could conclude that. Oh, yeah, I identified John, whom I saw earlier stab the victim. Sure, you could imagine that the, the words in 801 D1C meaning that. You could. You absolutely could. Uh, but the court says that's not what we're talking about here. This is not merely an accusation of an eyewitness. This is the perception of an eyewitness. It has to be as as the uh, identifies a person at that moment uh, that the declarant perceived earlier. Uh, you know, you can put parentheses around identifies a person parentheses at that moment as someone the declarant perceived earlier. That's what this rule is about. And if you think about this in terms of if you think about this in terms of um, um, uh, the, the paradigm example being um, eyewitness testimony at a, uh, at a at a lineup, then then I think you'll you'll get what this is all about. All right, my apologies for not making it uh, into class today, um, and I hope you all you know, took the time to um, you know, relax and, and and you know rejuvenate. I hope none of you gotten this um, this this whatever it is I have. I'm on medication now, so I won't be contagious when I see you on Wednesday. And um, I will uh, talk to you on, on, on Wednesday.